Don't just teach your children to read. Teach them to question what they read. Teach them to question everything. And that was a quote from George Carlin. And I'm not an actor again, but that's how he might normally open his Surviving the Matrix thing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there are five stages of grief, or so we are told. And by the way, what I'm sharing with you right now, I'm actually reading one of my journals that I posted on DeviantArt and, you know, making a YouTube version of it, just so you know. So that link should be down in the description thingy. Anyway, I digress. There are five stages of grief, or so we are told. Number one, denial and isolation. The first reaction to learning of terminal illness or death of a cherished loved one is to deny the reality of the situation, or really the loss of anything for that matter. <laughs> it is a normal reaction to rationalize overwhelming emotions, it's a defense mechanism that buffers the immediate shock. We block out the words and hide from the facts. This is a temporary response that carries us through the first wave of pain. Number two, anger, oh yes. As the masking effects of denial and isolation begin to wear, Reality and its pain re-emerge. We are not ready. The intense emotion is deflected from our vulnerable core, redirected and expressed instead as anger. The anger may be aimed at inanimate objects, complete strangers, friends, or family. Anger may be directed at our dying or deceased loved one. Rationally, we know the person is not to be blamed. Emotionally, however, we may resent the person for causing us pain for leaving us. We feel guilty for being angry, and this makes us more angry. The doctor who diagnosed the illness and was unable to cure the disease might become a convenient target. Health professionals deal with death and dying every day. That does not make them immune to the suffering of their patients or to those who grieve for them. Do not hesitate to ask your doctor to give you extra time or to explain just once more the details of your loved one's illness. Arrange a special appointment or ask that he telephone you at the end of his day. Ask for clear answers to your questions regarding medical diagnosis and treatment. Understand the options available to you. Take your time. As you can tell, I'm just quoting classic psychology here for the five stages of grief. <clears throat> Number three, bargaining. The normal reaction to feelings of helplessness and vulnerability is, is often a need to regain control. If only we had sought medical attention sooner. If only we got a second opinion from another doctor. If only we had tried to be a better person towards them. Secretly, we make a deal with God or our higher power in an attempt to postpone the inevitable. This is a weaker line of defense to protect us from the painful reality. Number four, depression. Two types of depression are associated with mourning. The first one is a reaction to practical implications relating to loss. Sadness and regret predominate this type of depression. We worry about the cost of burial. We worry that in our grief we have spent less time with others that depend on us. The space may be eased by simple clarification and reassurance. We may need a bit of helpful cooperation and a few kind words. The second type of depression is more subtle and, in a sense, perhaps more private. It is our quiet preparation to separate and to bid our loved one farewell. Sometimes all we really need is a hug. Number five, acceptance. Reaching this stage of mourning is a gift not afforded to everyone. Death may be sudden and unexpected, or we may never see beyond our anger or denial. It is not necessarily a mark of bravery to resist the inevitable and to deny ourselves the opportunity to make our peace. The space is marked by withdrawal and calm. This is not a period of happiness and must be distinguished from depression. Loved ones that are terminally ill or aging appear to go through a final period of withdrawal. This is by no means a suggestion that they are aware of their own impending death or such only that the physical decline may be sufficient to produce a similar response. Their behavior implies that it is natural to reach a stage at which social interaction is limited. The dignity and grace shown by our dying loved ones may well be their last gift to us. 
coping with loss is a ultimately uh, okay coping with loss is a ultimately a deeply personal and singular experience nobody can help you go through it more easily or understand all of the emotions that you're going through but others can be there for you and help comfort you through this process the best thing you can do is allow yourself to feel the grief as it comes over you resisting it only will prolong the natural process of healing now I would like to propose that the five stages of grief and loss are components of the first stage of paradigm shift. Ooh, how's that one for you? Now, from this point forward, uh, <laughs> this is not classic psychology. This is all me, baby. So here we go. Stage one, enlightenment through destruction of reality. To quote... A D I can't even pronounce this. A D Y A S H A N T I. I'm just crediting a quote here, and I have no idea how to pronounce that. Anyway, enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or being happier. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seeing through the facade of pretense. It's the complete eradication of everything we imagine to be true. We can easily see why the five stages of grief fit perfectly into the first stage of paradigm shift. Our reality begins its collapse and lies are replaced with truth and we go into denial and isolation. We blame others, blame ourselves, and we cling to our own destructive comfort zones. Then we become angry as the more we resist, the truth continues to persist. <coughs> Excuse me, let's clear my throat for a second. The extroverts become rebels without a clue. The introverts feel that all hope is lost, so what's the point? Some even consider suicide. Then comes the bargaining as we look for a savior. This or that truth movement or spiritual leader. Ron Paul will save us! Or the delusion of reforming the current paradigm, as if a piece of toilet paper that keeps being reused long beyond its expiration date can somehow be brought back to a pristine state when the truth is, it's time to flush it and replace the role. Sometimes we even try to nominate ourselves as a savior, under the delusion that it is somehow our responsibility to put the weight of the world on our shoulders. Then comes the depression, as we realize that all of our futile attempts to fix what's broken have from the beginning been predestined to the fate of failure. As Einstein once said, you cannot solve a problem using the same type of thinking which created it, or a similar sentiment from David Icke, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always gotten. After an amazing amount of attempts to sugarcoat our dichotomies, we finally get to what I refer to as the fuck it point, otherwise known as the state of acceptance. In the five stages of grief, it is said that reaching this stage of mourning is not a gift afforded to everyone. I disagree. I think it's afforded, but we are also not denied the ability to continue to make our own lives a living hell for ourselves, despite anything or anyone else. When we accept the reality of the first stage of paradigm shift and hit the fuck it point, we are then willing to let go of everything we assumed we thought we supposedly knew and be open to exploring the completely and utterly unknown. To venture into the void and be willing to create new realities for ourselves. Our reality is based on our belief systems, and one only need refer to the age-old argument between the archetypes of the optimist and the pessimist. Both are valid view yeah. <laughs> both are valid views, but both are only seeing half the picture. Neither are seeing the entire picture. Both could benefit from being open-minded to each other's perspectives, and both firmly reject each other's perspectives, as they cling to their indoctrination like a five-dollar hooker clinging to her profession and her heroin addiction as being the only real reality for her. Stage number two, emotional clearing, dealing with our demons, and facing our shit. This is where both our internal and external realities force us into deep introspection and self-analysis. When we've accepted the idea of letting go of everything we thought we knew, we are automatically faced with everything we thought we knew as the negative point of contrast. The positive being that, which is completely unknown, 
subtly jumping up in our faces. That which is opposite our belief systems. This gives us the opportunity to choose what we would really rather have in our lives. As an ultimate act of irony, <coughs> we are suddenly showered with abundance and prosperity, but perceive it as our worst nightmare made manifest. This is because we, <laughs> this is because, not because, fuck, 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 no. This is because, 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 the lie that if we see and express our own greatness, that it somehow is going to lead us to vanity, arrogance, and narcissism. We look at people such as celebrities, politicians, and rich snobs, and we say, this must mean that if I ever had public recognition, was ever in any position of power, or had any monetary wealth, that it would turn me into the very thing I hate. And so we embrace living in a hell of slavery, thinking that it is better than turning into a demon. Hitler learned that an easy way to control the masses as slaves is to brainwash them into flipping around their perceptions of heaven and hell. Hitler was correct, and that is the system we all live under today, as we live on a planet of 7 billion deceived idiots. Not saying that as a judgment, but merely a blunt recognition. Whatever our level of public recognition or monetary status, we all have the same amount of power. We've been tricked into thinking that being happy and being in power means to have materialistic abundances, or rather, that which is perceived as being abundance anyways. The possessions you own do not determine your level of integrity, success, or happiness. It is happiness which creates success. Those who have a lot of stuff, and you have a political pull, and lots of money, most of these people are neither happy nor successful, and in fact, are slaves who have more chains on them than we have on ourselves. So we are surrounded by really shitty examples of what abundance supposedly is, and we are told that these examples are the only reality. And of course, being idiots who truly do not know any better, we fall for this lie like a fish on a hook. So we think that getting more stuff will make us evil while existing in a society which brainwashes us into thinking that getting more stuff is the only way to survive in this world. Then of course you are going to force yourself to remain in a state of misery and poverty because you're going to think that to do otherwise is going to ruin your soul. You are not shown all the wonderful, beautiful, genuine, and authentic people who have money and use their power and their stuff to make this world a better place. Because you've been told that the mainstream media liars on TV have the only real view of reality. So once again, you do as you're told. You obey. You believe what you are told you must believe. You are caught in yet another lie once again. So when people try to tell you about all the good things happening in the world, I can't blame you for refusing to see the evidence. I can't blame you for rejecting the whole idea of it. It insults your intelligence, as it rightfully should. It goes against your programming. You've been a good little robot slave. You don't know any other reality. And it is scary to see any other reality. Heaven and hell have been reversed in your mind. Hell comforts you and heaven scares you. You've made hell your heaven and heaven your hell. Hitler has succeeded and won against you. You have lost. However, that's only one battle. Doesn't mean we have to lose the war, metaphorically speaking. This is why in stage two, being shown your greatness and your abundance is a nightmare which insults your intelligence. The first instinct you will have is to rage against it. However, what you resist persists. So your abundance will continue to be showered upon you as you perceive it as hell being unleashed against you with its full fury. All of the hell you have been taught to perceive as heaven will begin to detach from you. 
seeing as you have been taught to worship this hell as your almighty god. The detachment process will thrust you into a combination of sadness and anger. All of the dysfunctional, harmful shit you've been taught to worship and see as your guiding light and best friend will be torn from you and you will feel absolutely abandoned. As if God himself has thrown you under the bus and spit in your face. With everything good being showered upon you, and everything destructive being removed from you, like freezing cold water hitting hot glass, your mind will shatter, and you will feel worse than you have ever felt in your life. A pain beyond your wildest imagination of your own conception of your worst nightmare times ten squared. Like a heroin addict forced into rehab, you will mourn the loss of your drugs and hate everyone who cares about you. How dare they assist in this treason against you? How dare they take away your heroin? Those bastards. You will curse God, curse your friends, curse your family, curse the world, curse life, and curse yourself. You will begin to vomit out the emotional and psychological poisons as you face your own inner demons. And it will be painful. I'm not going to sugarcoat the process for you. It's a bitch. The world as you have known it will come to an explosive end, both inside of you and reflected in your external circumstances. You will lose some people and gain others. You might lose your current place you live. You might lose your job. Anything that has really not been good for you will be ripped away and it will suck. You will find yourself surrounded by new and better friends, a better place to live, a better job. You might even be self-employed. It will terrify you. You will think you are dreaming, or wonder if you've gone insane. It will terrify you. You will rage against it and try to destroy it, and you will find that it's not going away. Those new friends who care will observe you and keep extending the hand of friendship. You will view them as needy, annoying, pestering. You will tell yourself that you aren't good enough or worthy enough to be cared about. You will insist that they must have some hidden evil motive. You will believe that there is no way in hell anyone can really just like you for who you actually are. It will seem like a fiction, a lie, a delusion. Yet it will persist. And the more you resist it, the more you will pay your self-inflicted torture tax. And you will suffer the pain of your self-sabotage to levels you can't even conceive of, save for being perceived in the mirror of hindsight. The storm will last for as long as you insist you need it to, until it forces your surrender. It will continue to become more intense and painful as you resist it, and there is no limit to its ability to be intense or causing pain. There is only a limit to how much you can handle before you willfully surrender. Stage 3. Rebuilding Your Reality It's a lot like Stage 2, but without so much pain and suffering. You face the same shit, but from a new perspective, where you are now willing to see things in terms of opportunity, rather than birth. As you face each of your demons over and over just as before, this time it's a whole new ballgame. It's actually quite fun at this stage. It's no longer a nightmare. Like a child who has finally overcome their fear of the dark, they are now able to play in the dark and see it as tranquil rather than scary. When the light comes again, the child is no longer so overtaken by that either. It sees the light as a friend rather than an authority figure. Like playing with Lego blocks, now you get to have some fun experimenting, seeing what works for you and what does not, with more of a sense of playfulness rather than fear. The mind opens. Perceptions become more objective. Your view becomes more holistic. You can see more and more of the bigger picture. The magic of life begins to express itself in synchronicities. The people who are poisoned to you leave peacefully instead of dramatically. Usually they are so repulsed by you that they don't even approach you anymore, save for perhaps a fleeting and rather amusing encounter. As you watch, they run like hell, unable to withstand the light of your individuality. You will no longer feel obligated to hating them, judging them, feeling intimidated by them, no longer controlled by them, no longer bowing to the god of lies you used to bow to, that they still worship. You are playful in your expressions to them, and you can just as playfully tell them to go fuck themselves, as you can playfully say something sweet and polite. You respect your right to be as you are in any given moment, and equally respect the rights of those who hate you to do the same. You're no fun anymore. You can't be intimidated and controlled. You aren't the droids they are looking for, and so they move along. The experience entertains, enlightens, and amuses you. It acts as a mirror of who you used to be. You gain valuable insight into yourself from each of these sorts of experiences. 
Stage 3 affords you the ability and opportunity to clear up regrets and unfinished business, and do so in such a way that is non-destructive. Things begin to make more sense about this world, both positive and negative stuff. Increasing knowledge of both comforts you equally. You no longer worship one and shun the other. Just as the positive and negative prongs on a car battery, both are needed to start the car. You obtain forward motion. You begin to learn how to not feel so stuck anymore. I'm unable to reveal much more to you about stage 3. Nor can I tell you what other stages are ahead on this journey or how many more there are to go as of yet. This is because I personally am in the middle of stage 3. So, as much as I could dream and theorize about the rest, and yeah, there's no harm in doing so, and I do so quite often, this particular journal is intended for me to just speak about what I've already experienced. Probabilities and possibilities are fun to ponder, as they help us to use our imagination to shape our lives in the now, and as long as we're willing to take action when opportunity does not. Mm. Excuse me. Today, my friend Amber, aka the Pumpkin Queen, also known as Paranormal D, has written the first journal I've seen her write in a very long time, and in my humble opinion, her findings and expressions are a perfect stage to example. You can read that and my reply to it by clicking right on the very link that I'm reading here. Obviously, as I said, I'm, I'm reading a, a journal. But um, I will also be sharing a copy of what she wrote as well. And right below that on the page, there's a picture of Amber, smoking hot and beautiful as always. And this is also where I insert a shameless plug and suggest that you might want to go check out her gallery. And on the page I'm reading from, there's a link for you to do exactly that. Now here's what she wrote. This is war, is the title of her journal. I am declaring a war on humanity itself. Those who prove their ability to see clearly and be aware of their surroundings will be excluded from this. I have come to grips that it is only those who rise from their ashes and rise from their faults and mistakes and the ones who reign in the final endings. Except, I have not come here to reign in the end. I have not come here to start a riot or start a movement. I have come to give those a chance, a helping hand, if you will. I am here to wake you up from your disturbing sleep of ages and give you an opportunity of a lifetime. Although I may not offer safety or peace, I do offer truth and freedom. I realize that there is no way I can do this alone. I will no longer stand by and watch those I love be a slave to that of which they cannot fight back or control. I am here to show you reality for the first time. I am disgusted at that which continues to go on in this world, and I do believe somewhere deep in my soul that there is a fire that can light our way. I stand for the hidden truths and against the destruction of the lies that shroud the very eyes of humanity. I do not have the slightest idea where this could possibly go, but I am willing to find out. I'm not asking for an anarchy or rebellion. I'm not asking for war. I'm asking for those which have passion, whether it be for art or writing, song or creating, to awaken and take charge of our freedoms. You people are the ones who still have heart. I see this within you all. I'm writing this in hopes that one will realize that they are never, never alone in this silent battle. We are the fighters, lovers, peacekeepers, and songbirds. We are the psychopaths, heroes, lone wolves, and leaders. We are the only hope that could possibly be left for humanity. Knowledge is power. People forget that in these times. We were given the ability to think for ourselves and make our own judgments. Why should anyone deny us of that? I declare war on those who refuse to awaken, who deny me of knowing truth, and those who try to take away my freedoms for their own selfishness. If you have a fire that burns within you as well, this is your time to do the same as I. Wake up the world. We are the change we want to see in it. That's why I'm taking this stand. Don't be a sheep in this world of greedy, selfish wolves, and do not be afraid. You will never be alone in this fight, no matter where you are in the world. That's what she wrote. My response was as follows. This is very well spoken. Though there are some sentiments you already know I don't agree with, I'll focus on that which I do agree with. I too have learned that you cannot force people to wake up, and there is no crime in working only with those who are completely on par with you. One of the mistakes myself and many others have made in the past is to be deluded by the idea that we actually have the ability to convince anyone of anything. We do not. The only thing we can do is inspire like-minded people and show them that they are not alone. To be a light in darkness. 
Now, even with kindred spirits, there are... Yeah, excuse me. Now, even with kindred spirits, many are too terrified to embrace their own greatness. They are awake, they are aware, they are intelligent, they are motivated, but they are terrified. Not terrified to face the darkness, but terrified to face their own light and the light of their fellow kindred spirits. These people need to be reminded that the hand of friendship is extended if they wish to take it, but that there is no obligation to take it. No pressure, no attempts to force of will, merely an offer on the table that they can feel free to accept or reject. That the offer is always there, the door will always be open, but they, they are not obligated to walk through. That is okay for them to evolve at their own pace, and that pace is not bad or wrong or too slow or whatever. Their own pace of learning is valid, and the lessons they learn, be they harsh, are necessary. That learning a harsh lesson does not mean they are a failure. Quite the opposite. There are many who will be deserving of your friendship. You will extend your hand, and they will not take it. They will avoid you. They will fight you. They will run from you. Not because they are asleep, but because they are awake and terrified of light, having been slaves to the darkness for so long. Not because they hate you, but because they love you. But they find difficulty with being able to love anything about themselves, so they feel paralyzed. So take no offense to those who avoid you, who run from you, even those who lash out at you in anger. You are merely reflecting their own greatness, and they are terrified of what you represent. You represent what they are not used to. You are there to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Those who are most awake and least complacent have still become too comfortable with the dark and terrified of the light. They berate themselves, belittle themselves. They think they are worthless when they are not. Have patience with these sorts of people. I've had to learn to have patience with these sorts of people, and you know this fact about me too well. You know it extremely well. So, I already know that you can relate to me on this completely. The entire fabric of the universe seems to be changing, and this new frequency is incredibly intolerant of the same old, same old bullshit. The cosmic seasons are shifting from winter into spring. That which is aligned with the winter will fade away, and new life is embraced. But corruption goes out slowly and loudly, kicking and screaming like a tantrum in three-year-old, flapping like a fish on the deck with futile attempts to gasp for the air that is no longer available. This is why we see so much chaos in this world right now. It's not that there is a rise in corruption, it's that human consciousness is becoming more aware of what has always been, as the matrix of enslavement becomes increasingly transparent to the slaves. The slave masters try to use fear to beat people back down into complacency, and all it does is shake more people away. There's really no nice way to say this, as the facts are, excuse me, as the facts are that it's not survival of the fittest but of the most adaptable. The dinosaurs were fit, but where are they now? Far and few of them are left, alligators and crocodiles being on the short list of survivors of that period. They were adaptable and so they survived. Humanity is at a similar precipice as the dinosaurs. Those who are adaptable will survive, and the rest will not. Those who seek to perpetuate the same old hate, fear, and corruption will perish. Those open to a better world will probably live to see that world come. Earth has taken out the garbage because enough is enough. As far as truth movements and things like this, one thing I have learned about these is that they are the same as the Illuminati, the same core with a different paint job. The elites are blinded to a great many things because of their arrogance. They actually think that they are doing humanity a favor, just as the morons who participated in the Crusades thought that they were, thought that breaking every moral command that they held dear was somehow in service to God. How disgustingly laughable. Similarly, we see common denominators between the arrogance of the truthers and the arrogance of the elites. They both reject information that is outside of their paradigms. They both assume they are awake and enlightened. They both make an enemy of those who have different views than they do, while claiming to be on the side of freedom. They both try to shove their own dogmas down people's throats, so the factions, so the, and so the factions of the elites fight each other, just as the truth movements are factionized and fight each other. They both claim to endorse everyone's right to individuality, while simultaneously waging a war against individuality, creativity, intelligence, spirituality, freedom, and liberty. They both deem anyone who does not think exactly as they do and who does not bow to them as their enemy. The truth movements accuse anyone who thinks differently of being a shill. The elites accuse anyone who thinks differently of being a terrorist. 
Both use fear-mongering and pressure tactics. Both are locked into their own doctrines. I've been kicked out of not one, not two, but a grand total of three DeviantArt groups who claim to be on the side of freedom and unity. My crime that was worthy of being ostracized? Being myself and respecting the rights of anyone else to do the same. And to openly profess that I will absolutely respect everyone's rights to do this. So I committed the crime of refusing to bow down to the doctrines of the owners of these groups. I did not violate a single rule of policy of any of these groups. I was removed for refusing to bow down and kiss ass. This refusal being in the form of an open respect for everyone to hold whatever views they wish to hold, and openly stating that I respect everyone's views, individuality, and diversity. One group I was kicked out of quietly. Another was a private battle the admin tried to wage with me. The third was a public battle as responses to my own journal entries. In the first case, all I could do was shrug my shoulders and laugh. In the second case, I told the person that just because him and I did not agree on all subjects of discussion doesn't mean it's an attack on him. From the third, I was openly called delusional, among other things. And I continued to tell the man that I fully respected his rights to his views of me, or anything, or anyone else. My continued respect is what got me eliminated. The first two I found myself banned and blocked. The last one I was given an opportunity to take my leave of my own free will, and so I seized that opportunity and left by choice, rather than by force of the ban button being hit. Movements are nothing but group think. Real change comes from, as Max Egan so inspirationally put it, an idea whose time has come. Also, as was said in the movie Inception, more potent than a virus is an idea. Once it takes hold in the mind, it's unable to be eradicated, it sticks. Movements come and movements go, but ideas are immortal. So when an idea has reached a point where its time has come, it is an unstoppable force. It needs no movements. It needs no convincing of people by force. It sweeps the consciousness of humanity like a wave, lifting all who can adapt to safety and destroying all those who refuse it. It is a separation of the wheat from the chaff. So as you can see, for the most part, you and I agree. You've extended your hand and I accept, so I extend mine. If you accept, you already have my number. You're already on Skype, or already on my Skype. It would be nice to hear your beautiful voice once again. It's been a while. I oh, would believe me, she has a beautiful voice. But as I also said moments ago, acceptance cannot be enforced. Should you decline, the door will always be open. But you were not accepted. Or excuse me, you were not expected to walk through. Not accepted to walk through. Expected to walk through. Man, I cannot freaking talk today. <laughs> I hope you hold that level of patience with others. Someone not being ready yet doesn't make them your enemy. They have the right to learn at their own pace. I do hope you have the patience to be able to respect people's rights to this, as I have respected yours. Hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. I've much to be thankful for. Do you? With a little animated tight hug to vote on thingy, you know, there at the end. Then I just wrap this up with, to the readers of my journal, this journal, we all have our pace and process when it comes to this sort of thing. Whatever yours is, and however you feel about it, and regardless of what anyone else feels about it, know that what you need to go through is what you need to go through to learn. It doesn't make you bad, wrong, a failure, stupid, horrible, or any of the other self-berating lies you sometimes tell yourself. Healing can be a painful process, but you are healing. You are getting better, not worse. But sometimes the process of healing can make us feel like we're on death's doorstep. Value your pace and process. You reserve the right to whatever it happens to be.